really nice to be here. Um, I, yeah, I, I love Dartmouth. I was here for a long time. And it's just really cool to be back and in this context. And especially with all of you guys today, I think I've just been so impressed with like this great group of thinkers and we're all here to uh, think about a great set of questions. So I'm just grateful to be invited and included. So thank you. And all of us, I think, are in the room today because we're interested in social interaction, right? Which means that we likely care about this brain system shown here. It's often referred to as the default network. And the reason why we likely care about it, or I would say should care about it, is because the social neuroscience literature has really consistently implicated this network in social inference, or the process of trying to interpret what someone is thinking, feeling, their intentions, their personality traits, their social motifs, as, as Eshin might say. And so you would think that it's you know, really key to everyday social interaction. Now, let's say we were to run the following experiment, where participants are just alternating between solving challenging math problems and simply resting for 10 seconds at a time. Now, most of us in the room probably won't care at all about this really boring experiment, right? Because we're here because we're interested in social interaction. And this experiment clearly has nothing to do with everyday social life. And so you'd think that if you were to look at the time course of neural activity over the course of this kind of experiment, you probably just see something like this, right? Essentially just noisy data that isn't more or less associated with either of these experimental conditions. But of course, as many of you guys here probably already know, this isn't what happens when you run this kind of experiment, right? The weird thing is that these regions actually show a pattern like this. Systematic increases in activation when participants are just idly resting relative to doing some effortful cognitive task. And this is precisely why this network is called the default network. If you're wondering, it isn't something funky about the bold response. You see very similar uh, results if you do something like an ECOG, more direct recording procedures. And so, you know, there's been a lot of speculation that maybe some kind of social information processing is going on by default during rest. There's been a ton of review papers and meta-analyses suggesting this possibility, but precisely what that something is still remains like vastly underspecified. So we really don't have a clear model of what kind of social information processing might be going on by default at rest. And this gap is actually really surprising because findings like these have been replicated for like over 20 years. It's a really robust result. Uh, it's also surprising because a lot of the time we are just like chilling and mentally mind wandering and relaxing. And so this is a pretty big gap that we still don't have an answer uh, to. And so one social cognitive process that we think might be going on uh, during rest uh, is memory consolidation, right? And this hypothesis really builds off of really clean, elegant, earlier memory research. Matt Vandermeer has done this kind of work, looking at the role of post-encoding rest in committing new information that we've just encoded into a lasting memory. Now, this literature really pretty narrowly focuses on non-social learning during rest and not social learning. And this gap's also surprising given that we know that the brain regions that kick on really quickly as soon as we stop performing a task uh, are these regions that are associated with social cognition. In fact, given that they sort of kick on really quickly by default, like a reflex, you might even further speculate like, okay, well then maybe if they are consolidating social information, maybe they get the job done pretty quickly, right? They kick on and they're ready to go to learn the new social information. And so that's a, a key question that's been driving a set of experiments in my lab. Uh, we're trying to answer this question, does defaulting to the default network prioritize social learning during rest? Now, in order to answer this question, uh, we wanted to use stimuli with realistic depictions of both social and non-social information. And one way to do this that you guys have probably been hearing a lot about uh, here at Mind or maybe you do in your own research is to use video footage, right? Videos are great for showing naturalistic everyday behavior. Uh, one potential issue for our particular question with using naturalistic video footage is that a narrative is often confounded with the social information processing that occurs, right? So if in my lab we found that social information was prioritized um, in, in the memory consolidation process uh, when participants watch a movie or a television drama, it would be really hard to know if it's because social information is prioritized sort of full stop or if the narrative that sort of clusters the social information creates a schema that incidentally improves memory performance, right? So I don't think that's a problem for other people's research. I think it just depends on your question. It would be a, an issue for ours. So what we did was we actually turned to this documentary film, Samsara, 
because it's a beautiful film um, and it was intentionally uh, crafted by directors and producers to actually not have any narrative. And the whole goal of this documentary is to showcase like real life all around the world, showing montages of people and places. And so that was one way that we got around this confound. And what we did was we had participants uh, observe Samsara in the scanner. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to, this is work uh, spearheaded by Courtney Jimenez, a graduate student in my lab. She's done a great job with this project. So she deserves her proper shout out. Um, and so what, what she did was, uh, we didn't have participants watch the whole documentary in the scanner, right? It's like more than two and a half hours. It's beautiful, but that would be a lot. We also didn't do that because we wanted to be sort of, uh, experimentalist about this. So uh, Courtney had an online set of participants watch every clip from this movie and uh, rate it along a number of dimensions, like valence, arousal, interestingness, familiarity, and also sociality or the extent to which they have to do with people. So then she could grab a subset of those many clips that she knew in advance were normed on these dimensions that are often conflated with sociality, but that significantly varied on the social dimension. So participants watch these video clips during encoding in a fully randomized order, do a resting state scan, and then a surprise recognition memory test. And so consistent, you know, first clue with this idea that social information might be prioritized in the learning process, participants demonstrated better memory for the social relative to non-social video clips, despite the fact that these videos were normed on all those dimensions that you immediately think like, yeah, come on, it's not social, it's because of blah. Well, we know that it can't be because of blah. Um, you might also be wondering, you know, the y-axis here is D prime divided by correct RT. Uh, we see the same result if we just look at D prime, or if we just look at correct RT, or if we look at hits, or if we look at hits minus false alarm. So this is this persists. It's not just something quirky about how we choose to define accuracy here. Now, when looking at encoding, uh, we see the usual suspects, right? When you watch social videos, you see more activation in default network regions. Um, in contrast, when you watch uh, the non-social videos relative to social, uh, you get parahippocampal place area. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of the non-social clips are of like, these really interesting and beautiful locations and scenes. And you also get left ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, which um, actually is very consistently implicated in encoding and subsequent memory effects in the cognitive neuroscience literature that tends to focus on non-social memory. All right, so that's encoding, but nothing too exciting here. Sorry, I have a question. Ah, good question. So because we normed the video clips in advance, we knew that half the video clips were scored higher on this dimension of sociality by a different set of participants relative to the others. Yeah. Yes, but we bin it in this instance of social versus, and they're like massively different. It's like, not, yeah. Um, Cool. So this is what's going on at encoding, right? But that's nothing new. That's sort of just replicating other work. What we really care about is what's going on during the subsequent rest period, right? Do we see any index of um, prioritized social consolidation? And so to do this, we use an approach called uh, neural pattern reinstatement, uh, which assesses the degree to which neural patterns engage during encoding while watching the videos reappear during the subsequent rest. So we take our social and non-social neural pattern templates from encoding and run them through the resting state scans simultaneously. Um, conceptually, all we're doing here really is just template matching, right? Looking for instances during rest where the uh, pattern engaged at encoding is highly correlated with that instance. Now, first off, what we see is that repeating left ventral lateral prefrontal cortex non-social patterns uh, more often during the subsequent rest uh, predicts better non-social memory. So this is a nice extension of that cognitive neuroscience literature uh, showing that what they see at encoding and subsequent memory effects persists during rest. But we don't see uh, the same relationship in this region for the social learning. In contrast, it's repeating the social pattern in DMPFC that predicts social memory performance. And the same was not true for the non-social memory performance. For those of you, the reviewers in the room, these correlations are meaningfully different from one another. Um, and so what we're seeing here is, is the link between neural pattern reinstatement uh, during rest and subsequent memory so far seems to be associated with different prefrontal uh, regions. But remember, what we really care about in this study is whether there might be some sort of prioritization of social learning during rest, right, because of these default network properties. And so at a, a first pass to look at this was really pretty crude, like nothing fancy. We just binned our resting state scan, which is I think about eight and a half minutes long. 
uh, into early, middle, and late rest, right? And looked at the number of neural pattern reinstatements for the social uh, template in DMPFC, because we already had been seeing that it was associated with subsequent rest. And, and we see uh, an initial clue that was exciting to us. So you see more reinstatement in this region of the social pattern during the earlier relative to middle and late period. You don't see the same kind of effect in the left ventral lateral prefrontal cortex for the non-social stuff. And um, even more exciting to us is that when we broke down that correlation that I showed you earlier that looks over number of reinstatements over all of rest in DMPFC, we see that that correlation is really driven by the earlier rest period. So the correlation is actually stronger if you just look at the beginning of rest and uh, it dissipates or really disappears over the middle and late rest. And again, we don't see the same kind of pattern in LVLPFC. It's actually um, consistent uh, throughout each stage, right? So there's a, a lot to like, I think, about this particular set of findings. We're excited about them. We recently submitted them for review because we think that they're consistent with this idea that, you know, if you think about when you have a to-do list, right, you have a bunch of stuff you want to get done. And then if I were to tell you, you know what, you can only do one of those things before you get your PhD, what are you going to pick? You're probably going to pick, <laughs> if you're smart, you're going to pick an important thing, right? What, what do you want to do first? It demonstrates your priority, right? And so we think something's going on like this in the brain. These are just, you know, obviously initial findings. We need bigger samples, but it's sort of like the brain's checklist is to like, oh, I better get that social stuff locked in because who knows what will happen next. So there's a lot to, to like about that data set. Um, we norm the stimuli so we could be like careful scientists and precise and then get insight into this question. But in my lab, uh, we're also interested in understanding social memory in more interpersonal contexts, right? Does engaging the default network during rest help us learn the actual social information that people share with us in everyday life? And of course, in everyday life, uh, social and emotional information co-varies. I think Talia nicely pointed that out. It's messier, it's complicated. And we wanna know if these results you know, do we see something similar in that context and how can we capture it? And one aspect that we've gotten interested in lately, which is a bit of an offshoot for my lab in terms of research directions, um, has been thinking about how, how are we able to support those that we're friends with in times of need by helping them uh, see the good and the bad, focus on the positive of their challenging experiences. So I think all of us have had the experience of, you know, a friend coming to you and, you know, sharing something difficult they're dealing with. And, you have a couple strategies, right? Like, how are you going to respond to them? And, you know, you could double down and be like, yeah, that really sucks. That seems like that guy really hates you. I don't know. Like, maybe you should transfer. Um, you could do that. Uh, it turns out it's not great for friendship. Uh, psychologists have shown this for a while, that it's not good. I think common sense tells us that it's not good. Um, it's also not good to just, like, completely brush them off. What's good is to acknowledge their hardship, but also help them find the silver lining, right, and what they're dealing with. And it turns out this is a big individual difference. Um, the literature on resilient coping shows that time and again that not everyone is so good at finding the good and the bad either, either for other people or even for themselves. And being better at it is associated with well-being, um, physical and mental health. So we got kind of interested in this because we also know very, very little about the neural mechanisms that help people see the good and the bad. And uh, that on its own was interesting to us. And then we had our eye kind of towards like, is there something going on after you hear all this heavy stuff that someone tells you that helps you sort of uh, see the good and the bad? And is that an individual differences, uh, difference that might be um, important during post-encoding rest? So to examine this, we ended up choosing videos from YouTube vloggers. Um, here, these are all people who have a YouTube channel. Um, where they discuss the, their experience with cystic fibrosis. This was actually a data set collected by Eleanor Poye, who's somewhere here, maybe, Eleanor. Uh, Eleanor was a lab manager uh, in our lab years ago and is now wrapping up her PhD, which is both heartwarming and lovely and like terrifying because I feel like I still just finished my PhD, but I'm really <laughs> proud of her. She did a great job with this data set. Um, so uh, patients are talking about their experience with the disease. Um, and I should mention it's it's a obviously predominantly negative information that they're sharing here and there. They say things where you could kind of glean, you know, oh wow, it kind of seemed to they got closer to their friend as a consequence. You could find positive meaning here, um, but it is predominantly negative. As a control condition, uh, participants also watch Khan Academy videos, which are educational videos also found online. And here, these are, are videos that explain the biology of cystic fibrosis. So in both conditions, uh, this is within subjects, participants are hearing someone describe cystic fibrosis, but of course in the patient videos, it's much more interpersonal than the information conveyed here. 
So here's sort of a bird's eye view for our paradigm. Um, you can see we interleaved resting state scans uh, in between the different video types and outside of the scanner, uh, participants were given a surprise memory test, a free recall where they simply wrote down everything they remembered from each of the videos. And uh, Eleanor did a great job with this and she even got her own publication from this data set, but she passed the torch to our newer lab manager, Sid, Who's going to, who did the work that I'm going to be talking about now. So what Sid did with these uh, memories is he um, submitted the participants' memories to a text analysis um, where he used a sentiment analysis approach that quantifies the extent to which participants' memories focused on the negative to positive aspects, right? So here, these are words written in, you know, extrapolated from their longer entry uh, from two different participants, one with a very positive uh, memory score, one with a very negative one. These are patient memories. Um, we did the same thing for the Khan Academy videos. And one thing that's kind of, you know, honestly surprised me, but is sort of a win for us in a way, even though we didn't see it coming, was that um, it turns out that the, uh, the affect scores in the patient and science videos are actually not significantly different from one another. When I first saw that, I thought like, Sid, you made a mistake, like there's no way. But then when we went back and looked, we realized like, no, it actually makes sense because when you look at the Khan Academy videos and what people are remembering, people are writing things like, you know, then the cells attack the immune system, which creates a lot of pain. But if you give this drug, then you'll feel a lot better. So they are using affect words um, with, that are positive and negative. And so that's actually really helpful for us because then if we see any neural data that's showing differences, either at encoding or consolidation, uh, we can, can try to make the case that it's something not just about affect, but affect tethered to this more interpersonal context. Now, if the default network does help some listeners uh, see the good and the bad, it's worth thinking through how this might all unfold. And there's actually this theory um, called the broaden and build theory of positive affect developed by Barb Fredrickson at UNC. And according to her theory, uh, negative affect really constricts the kinds of cognitive processes that people can entertain. So the idea is that negative affect evolved to help us deal with threatening situations and that it's beneficial uh, to, to like consider a discrete set of things uh, in that mental state or in that negative emotion state. That's actually not unique to her theory. A lot of uh, theories and research suggests that when you're in a negative mood, you have like restricted uh, cognitions. What's unique to her theory is that she thinks that a unique feature of positive affect is that it's quite the opposite. Positive affect and evolve in the context of fight or flight and instead encourages sort of nuanced cognitive processing, right? So think about creativity, curiosity. These are things that cognitively we often do when we are in a positive mood. And so the broaden and build theory in conjunction with the memory consolidation literature would actually suggest that participants who end up with more negative memories, they should have more. Uh, similar uh, consolidation processes, right? There's a discrete set of where their mind can go and everyone's gonna have the same discrete set because there's only so many things to think about in response to the videos. In contrast, uh, people who end up with more positive memories, according to Broaden and Build, they might have idiosyncratic cognitive processes uh, in their consolidation process. So this was what we were looking for going into these analyses. The approach we used is called um, inner subject representational similarity analysis. Um, it involves four steps. I heard earlier in the week that a number of you are actually already working with this method, um, but maybe not everyone is. And it was definitely new to me when I started uh, thinking about these ideas. So I'll just quickly walk us through it. So the first thing you do is grab some data. It doesn't have to be neural. You, it often is. In our case, we're interested in functional connectivity um, between default network regions. So what we did is for each participant, we grab um, ROI to ROI connectivity for every ROI pair in the default network. So everyone gets, you know, eight, uh, <laughs> a set of connectivity uh, values, right? And so each participant, that set becomes their default network connectivity uh, profile, it, so to speak. It's a vector that reflects their functional connectivity. And then we look at how similar the functional connectivity is between sets of participants. So this step would tell us how similar my default network functional connectivity profile looks to Luke's functional connectivity profile, for example. Then what we do is we populate a subject by subject matrix with each uh, pair's functional connectivity profiles and then compare that matrix to a memory similarity matrix. So here I should mention we're collaborating with Emily Finn on this work um, and uh, she coined the term for this model very nicely, very cleverly 
She calls it the Anacurna model um, after the Tolstoy quote, all happy families are alike and each unhappy family is unique in its own way. So for the Broadman build theory, you actually flip the valence around where we're asking for the memory score, are all negative memory participants, uh, neural processes alike and all positive memory participants idiosyncratic or nuanced in what's going on neurally. So here's what Sid found. Um, indeed, we see that the default network's functional connectivity during the rest after patient viewing, right, post-patient rest, um, is significantly related to this anacurna model. Now, importantly, we have all those phases of the experiment that we can look at. So we run the anacurna model on baseline rest, post-science rest, patient video watching, science patient, science video watching. Um, it's not significant in those instances. Uh, we also look at other networks, like what about the limbic system, right? You'd think that might be involved. Well, no, actually, we don't see that that's significant either in any phase. And then per a reviewer's request, we also now run a partial mantle test where we are looking at this effect that we already know is significant and controlling for the other possible effects, and we still see that this persists, okay? So overall, these analyses are triangulating on this idea that there's something happening during the post-patient rest period that's uh, showing this sort of Broadman build kind of effect. All right, now remember from Courtney's data, we were seeing evidence of this uh, prioritization, right? The action was happening, at least in the DMPFC, during early rest. And so uh, Sid wanted to know if he could see something similar in his data. And so what he did here, these are actually what I'm gonna show you, uh, results from a sliding window analysis, where he looks at the functional connectivity and occurring effect during post-patient rest over time. And he just wants to know, when is it working? And what he sees is that indeed it's uh, the earlier rest. So the, we start at 90 seconds because we want it like a reliable measure of functional connectivity, like at shot one, as opposed to starting at zero, and then slide the window from there for each TR. And his results are actually quite similar to Courtney's, even though we sort of in a meta way decided to bend the resting state stand. They're both seeing that it's about three minutes of rest that really matters before it drops off. Now, uh, you might also be wondering, well, who's doing the heavy lifting, right? There are a lot of regions in the default network, and is one or a set of regions really guiding or driving this uh, anacrona result? Uh, we ran a subsetting approach where we sort of keep running our models, like throwing out ROIs at a time, changing the network size. And what, what we find is that it's actually the VMPFC that's really important uh, for uh, creating these like sort of more uh, idiosyncratic consolidation mechanisms uh, at rest, leading to more positive memories, which really nicely complements work done here at Dartmouth by Luke and Jeremy and Eshin and others, where they've also seen in the context of watching naturalistic footage that idiosyncratic VMPFC responding relates to affective experience. Here, we actually don't see action at encoding. I suspect it has something to do with differences in the kind of experimental stimuli and also the method here, but we are seeing that the idiosyncratic responding in terms of its network connectivity is driving these broaden and build effects. And so just to sort of summarize those two studies, we are seeing initial evidence that defaulting to default network regions may facilitate how we form our social memories. The DMPFC might be really key to prioritizing social memory consolidation sort of broadly construed. Uh, the VMPFC may be key in contrast to generating individual differences in the socio-emotional uh, memory consolidation process. And so, you know, I wish I had some like really grand conclusion besides those like little like student like bullet points, like I found this, this and this, you know, but the truth is we have way more to figure out uh, and I don't have a like grand conclusion for you yet, um, partly because you know, forming memories of everyday experiences is super important, no doubt, but it's certainly not the only thing that helps ensure that we're like socially savvy, right? So, and, and while I do believe the results I showed you today, I suspect it's not the only thing that the default network is doing that's, you know, promoting sociality. So my lab are really interested in really like just drilling down and figuring out all the different things that might be uh, important uh, in addition to uh, social memory consolidation. And one thing we uh, think about a lot is how like, yes, we are hypersocial, definitely believe that we're a social species, but we're also constantly kind of like moving in and out of social experiences. And so uh, the memory work I just showed you kind of gives us, you know, initial clues into what might be going on when we walk away from a social experience, right? We just did a bunch of stuff and then it's like, you know, helping us commit it to memory. But what about just as we approach a new social interaction? 
is the default network doing anything? Um, is it shaping, you know, how we perceive those things? And the idea of the memory consolidation work really builds off of rodent work, um, looking at replay during rest, but that literature also has ideas about preplay during rest, right? What's going on neurally before anything has happened that shapes how it's encoded? And so that's a whole new set of studies that we're really excited about. And I didn't have time to talk about today, but Danica Gessler, who's here at MIND, um, has really compelling data on this where we're trying to figure out if the default brain states you enter in the default network sort of shape and predict your subsequent social thought. Can we predict who you're going to think about next, what you're going to think about next? And she has really cool data that I didn't have time to show you, but ask her about it um, when you have a chance. And so, yeah, uh, that's where we are so far. I just want to thank uh, the students in my lab, um, like the VMPFC, they do the heavy lifting here, and I just get to have fun talking about it. So thank you. And yeah, any questions? It's cool. Just curious observation. The theory of mind network and fault mode network are overlapping, but interleaved in the space. It's not curious whether you think that the work that you're showing here is maybe suggesting a reason for this close spatial proximity between these two networks. I mean, I guess I'm not totally convinced by the work showing that they're totally non-overlapping. I mean, I think it's like a Venn diagram, basically. So there are going to be parts that are more associated with social inference and others by default. But there, uh, as many studies that show um, separation, there's others showing like more overlap. So I think it, I just not to criticize one or the other. It's just that I think we need to do more work to really figure it out. But I, all of that said, uh, assuming like let's run with that. Uh, yeah, there could be different like brain states that they might both be doing something kind of social, I guess, but one's more like active inference and one's more like dealing with it before or after. But um, does that make sense? So like what my mind looks like when I'm like processing a social motif right in front of me might not be the exact same neurons as when I'm trying to make sense of it later or right before. Right. And yeah. It seems like potentially a, a role of the theory of mind network is that active online processing and then you need to consolidate that processing that having those regions next to each other would facilitate. Right, and that's an interesting story. hypothesis. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. Uh, that would be fun to test. Um, I like that idea, yeah. Uh, do you, in terms of like what the default mode network does, do you have a sense of like, or like a, even just like a guess about, is it like, the default mode network's like main role is like social stuff, or is it like it, social is one of many things, or maybe it's like more social than other things, or or even just like something like that, or like whatever you're thinking about, and you often are thinking about social. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, uh, I guess like on the other end, like social can mean a lot of things. Like, is it the appearance of a face, or like an interaction with like that be with another same species thing, or like. Mm -hmm. Talking to like a video of someone possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. This came, yeah, yeah. No, these are great <laughs> questions. For is it doing all social or is it doing other things? I would say no and yes. The tricky thing is that, like, like I feel like a lot of our assumptions come from the history of who studied what first. So, like, yeah, the default network's also associated with autobiographical memory, episodic simulation, and they got there first. Uh, and then the social neuroscience come along and then it's like, but in those studies with the, who got there first, it's not like they have a social condition. And then when you start to run those studies, not a lot of people have done it, but this guy in Europe has, and it's usually more associated with the social doing other stuff. So yes, you do it for episodically simulating putting your sweats on, which I don't do a lot, but <laughs> you, you could put someone in the scanner and ask them to do it and you see default network regions, but you'll see it more if you ask them to simulate like more social so but so all to say i don't i do think that we use it for other things um what was your other, oh the face thing yeah so we don't see we in courtney's data set she does get fusiform face area and encoding um but she doesn't see it uh predicting uh memory consolidation during rest or even encoding for that matter so yeah is it like about interaction or so i actually think it's about inference but i think it, it's so i say social 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 but when i say it i actually really mean like thinking about um, minds, I guess, um, which it tends to be the more social psychological. Yeah. 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 Y
But also like, I think uh, just drawing out something that I think is really interesting what you said, like, do you think that there's a way of thinking of the autobiographical kind of results as social to yourself at a different time, which mm. is like a another mind, which is like you, like however many days ago when you're putting on socks, yeah, or whatever, yeah. which does feel like an other mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Um, and yeah, there is some data showing that um, when you think about yourself right now, you get different portions of the default network than when you think about yourself in the past or future. So yes, I agree. <laughs> it's not a good answer. I also want to be mindful. To, I'm happy to take more questions, but I don't know. If, we're good on that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. This might be kind of out there, because I'm not up to date on this literature or anything, but it seems to me that spaces can, like, because you, in your samsara study, you, you had social stimuli and then you had non social stimuli, be like mostly places, right? And landscapes. And yeah. It occurs to me that not all places are created equally, in that there are spaces that have the potential for social activity and others that uh -huh. not so much. Is there any work on these kinds of like social spaces? That's a good question. Actually, and it relates to one of Jeremy's points that I realized I didn't answer, where he was like, what if you have like either similar, I think Emily probably spoke, like, I don't think that the stimuli itself externally has to be social. I think the mental processing that you impute on the stimuli should be social. And so for that reason, I, I would agree with you that probably, we don't have enough stimuli in Courtney's data to look at this, but like in her non-social stimuli, some of the things are like Mecca, right? So people, might have some sort of social beliefs about what happens at Mecca, and then other ones are just like a tree or whatever, mm -hmm. um, which might be quite meaningful socially here. But uh, <laughs> but uh, all to say, yeah, I, we don't know. We don't have enough stimuli to look at it, but it's quite possible that you would like use this system to make social inferences of where the stimuli itself isn't social. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so. So, um, what's a what's a minimal resting time? Um, to do um, monitoring, uh, maybe the sub two activation. Yeah. Now, now the question is, uh, what type of social information is social relationship or Trades. Yeah, good question. Um, we don't know in this data set about like, is it their trades? Is it this or is it that? Um, Mark Thornton has done really nice work, uh, like trying to parse out, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, the trait space versus the action space versus the, um, you would be a good person to talk to about like, what my read on it is like, you kind of just keep seeing the default network. It's pretty hard to parse out like this is the personality traits part of the default network and this is the um, action space. Though so he, he should ask him. Um, in our data, we don't, we haven't gone there, but we have thought about like um, what dimensions of social stimuli might be more or less prioritized. So again, in Courtney's data set, she only has like 60 videos, which is a lot, but we've thought about creating a much bigger one where we have like videos that are about social connection, videos that are about like someone failing. I don't know. So these kinds of things. Um, ask Mark. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, in Danica's data, we actually look at like jitter, so really short rest. So. In my mind, I see rest as like, as soon as I, as the experimenter or like out in the world, it, you're not being forced to think about something. It's like endogenous or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, we do look at it as brief as jitter time courses, like, you know, two to three seconds. Um, whether that counts as rest from the more psychological perspective, I think is open for debate. Thank you. Uh, one more question. 